third and fourth hand stuff. But I, I guess um, it's about Nero, the emperor mm-hmm. of Rome. Yeah. And I guess because uh, he was he was a young guy when when he became the emperor. And apparently he liked to um, dress up as a commoner and go out in the streets and start fights <laughs> with people. Him and his buddies. Like what a like a frat guy move. Fucking playing the knockout game. Yeah. And so apparently um a senator named Montanus but I couldn't find any other name on him, which is that just means mountain. He's Senator Mountain. Okay. Um apparently they got into some fisticuffs and he kicked the shit out of Nero. Cause he was like, I don't know, he's like 18 or something. And this dude's like, fuck you, kid. Bam. Beat him up. And then he found out that it was actually Nero, his emperor, that he beat up. And he was like, oh, man. So he sent an apology note. Which, so, uh, you know, this was all on the, you know, wink, wink, nod, nod kind of thing. It's like people knew about it, but you didn't bring it up. So this guy, after he fires off uh, his apology email or whatever the equivalent was in those days in 56 AD. Uh, that was a, uh, that was a uh, hot mail back then. <laughs> um, I guess as soon as he sent it off, he was like, Oh wait, I could have just not acknowledged this and everyone would have ignored it, <laughs> including Nero. But then because he acknowledged it, uh, he was in deep shit. He was like, oh, man, I fucked up. Couldn't take it back. Like Ugh. like firing off a, a risky text. Can't take it back. It reminds me of the dude that like self-exiled for like seven years because he farted in front of the queen. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to episode 14 of It's Another Podcast, though. I'm Mike. And I'm Joe. And today we're, uh, well, what are we talking about today, Joe? The big oops, blunders, quaint mistakes, things of that nature. History's greatest blunders. All right. So what do we got up first? Uh, let's see. First, uh... I want to talk about the uh, Cleveland Balloon Fest of 1986. I'm going to lead off with this one. All right. Trying to scroll your window. It's not working. Yeah, I try and do that every time that you <laughs> screen share. Uh, so this Balloon Fest, 86, eh? Cleveland. Yep. Sounds like a, just a winning combination there. Yeah, well, it's Cleveland, so you know that's not going to go well. Uh, yeah, 1986, um, the United Way started this uh, huge event, which, hey, like, only best of intentions, you know. Um, they wanted to break the uh, Guinness World Record for the release of balloons at one time. Uh, How many? Which had... Uh, about one and a half million balloons. Uh, this was coordinated by uh, a company, Balloon Art by Treb, which is a Los Angeles-based company, headed by Treb Heining, who, by all counts, 
nice guy. His name um, was Treb? Yeah, Treb. T-R-E-B. The fuck kind of name is Treb? French, maybe? I don't know. It's not French at all. Maybe it's short for... Um... Treblinka? <laughs> yeah. I was going to say Trebbing. That's that's not right. Tre- his, name was, his name would be... Full name would be Trebbing Heining. That's... Yeah, no, that does not, not roll off the tongue easily. Treb Trebman, Trebulation. It's short for uh, Treberson, Trebaker, Trebfree, Treb Trebshinsher, Trebshinsher, Trebmillion. Well, in any case, he just shortened it to Treb. Good on him. Sure. Dude's got a great pair of lungs blowing up 1.5 million balloons. Oh, yeah. Did it all himself. No, they they had a an army of volunteers, and uh, they had people going out selling sponsorships, uh, 50 cents a balloon. So they, and they the, got some decent money up front. These are all filled with helium, which is a non-renewable resource on planet Earth. It's awesome. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Exactly. Just a massive waste of resources. Yeah. They had a big old uh, rectangular structure. Took up like a city block. Uh, 250 feet by 150 feet, about three stories high. And then just like netting over that. So then they had all these volunteers filling up the balloons and then just letting them go. So it would, the net would catch it underneath. Mm-hmm. Um. And then on September 27th, 1986, that was the big day. Um, I'm going to play, I'm going to play a video that just really captures, uh, the excitement and, and joy of this event. All right. Let's do it. Here it goes. All right. Three seconds, four seconds, I understand. How long is it going to take these kids with no experience? We're figuring that they'll do about two to three balloons a minute. I've been doing this since I was 15 years old, so it's unfair to compare. But uh, two to three balloons a minute, each kid is going to do uh, correctly about 700 balloons or Hooting so his own horn uh, there. for the day. And, and we'll do it in about four to six hours, all the balloons. Don't remember, folks, don't park on the square yeah, he, because he this sounds is like the place he's from for your car this weekend. <laughs> Back to you. Sounds like fun, David. Thank you. I understand you. we might have a northerly wind, too, so they'll all wind up over Canada. <laughs> Okay, that's going to be important in a little bit. The the northerly wind. <laughs> right. There <laughs> we go. <laughs> <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, live from downtown Cleveland, it's Big Chuck and Little John in front of the biggest happening around. Okay, thank you, John. And we have a, a real story to tell you. This is not, we're not making this up. It's really happened. Mary Ellen bought two bunches of balloons to give to John and I here. She came down, and one of the bunches of balloons she had tied to her watch. And the watch opened up, and uh, the balloons took the watch, and it's now going out east somewhere. So John and I say, if so, anybody hey, finds Mary Ellen's watch quick? tied to a bunch of balloons like this. Uh, they never found the watch. Oh, shit. Okay, but next story. Do you no, think um, that's not the end? So, of it. like uh, the news news partner team here, Big Chuck and Little John. Do you think there's another uh, team out there, like Little Chuck and Big John? Oh yeah, no, they definitely had to like delineate between the different teams. Yeah, that would get confusing. I think Big John and Little Chuck were total assholes. They they were like the weather guys. Yeah. Big wait, which ones are these guys? I forget. This is Big Big Chuck and Little John. Yeah. They're they're the good guys. They're the A team. Yep. Little Chuck and Big John though, they fucking scrubs. Yep. Okay. All right. Carry on. Continuing. Yeah. And if you return it to the station, we'll have all kind of rewards for you. Okay, thanks for coming down there. That was a lie. Whoa, he just straight up open done? mouth kissed that name? lady. Tanya it was, it was the 80s. Okay, Tanya, show everybody what you have on your hands there. What are those? <laughs> that's that's definitely okay, Little John for? right there. Oh, yeah, that's definitely Little John. Big Chuck and Little John, yeah. Yeah, he's a tiny little guy. 
Imagine if they put Little Chuck and Little John together. Oh, total chaos. That'd be weird. Yeah. And this lady, her fingers are just been rubbed raw from tying balloons. Yeah. I'm assuming. Yes. <laughs> Wait from stores. Stores from your hand. Okay. Did you get any blisters? Yeah, three. Are you having a good time? Yeah. Are you tired? Yeah. Okay. Okay, Chuck, as you can see, they're going strong. They're blowing them up. I still think they have the record. Back to you, Chuck. <laughs> I love little John. That, uh, been in the plan- yeah. Yeah. Oh. Um, the the palpable excitement kind of breaks my heart knowing what's coming up. <laughs> really stages since March of this year. So a lot of technical research and research through the city permits. Uh, it's endless. It's absolutely astonishing to try and get something like this off, let alone waiting for good weather. So this is a big plus for Cleveland. Oh, it's something that, you know, they predicted 70% chance of showers today. And I think this is a prime example of what United Way is trying to do in terms of saying, it's Cleveland, it's your time. It's time to say yes. It's time to say it is a happening city. We are on the move. It's no longer the butt of jokes or anything. I've been in this city now for six months, and I absolutely love it. You know, my wife and I have even talked about moving here, and our friends in L.A. think we're nuts. But it is a wonderful place. If I had money to invest, this is where I'd be invested. In. Very, very good. Very good Thank, you. Thank you. Okay, so as, as he, that guy, Treb, was just saying that there was supposed to be a 70% chance of showers, and when they were doing that, the skies were clear, but looming on the horizon. <laughs> was a high pressure rain system. Okay, so they they decided to release the balloons early. But not early enough. They should have had they should have had okay, one we... big balloon and tied yeah. it to the net to release the net for all the little balloons. Anyway, That's okay. I wish I wish you'd been there. Back back to back to the story. <laughs> we were just talking 10, 10, 9 8 Seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. Here they go. Amazing. And the fan is up. There they go, John. The Guinness Book of World Records has just been broken in Cleveland. Over one million five hundred thousand balloons going up in the air at this very, very moment. Look at the crowd go. We did it. We did it, John. Here it goes. It's completely covering the terminal tower. Oh, look at that. I want to sing up, up, and away. <laughs> I, I can tell they're very, I mean, obviously it was a big deal, but I feel like even then, uh, environmentally, this was. Yeah, well, I mean, it was 86. No one gave a shit about that back then. Yeah. Yeah. Just tree huggers. Yeah hippies and commies mountain hermit prophets we saw this coming a long ways away it looks like a tumor eating that building <laughs> yeah <laughs> this is a little more of the video and then and then we'll we'll talk more about this all right all right it is awesome, ladies and gentlemen, to actually be down here and see the multicolors that are going up in the air at this moment. We did it, John. This is it. Let's do it for Cleveland. Yeah. Yay, Cleveland. Ladies and gentlemen, there is no mistake on the lake anymore. Cleveland has now broken the Guinness Book of World Records and released over 1,500,000 balloons. Okay, so it if you you can see in the video, obviously anyone listening cannot see it. Uh, the balloons aren't really just going straight up. A lot of them are moving more, just sort of laterally. Mm-hmm. Maybe you know, fifty feet in the air. Yeah. Um. Because this is right when, like that cold front and and the rain started coming in. Hi, Gadget. Okay, what do you? <laughs> just... uh, wait. <laughs> Gadget just skipped ahead. By... <laughs> Where are we at? 
All right. Now we're a little Can you further. You turn off but... my computer gadget. You're about to, aren't you? What secrets are we about to release that you don't want told, gadget? You fucking. It's completely covered it's in the Cleveland. Terminal Tower. We already did that. Can you can you hear gadget rubbing up on the microphone? Yep. <laughs> oh, think, I can't. Think of that, Chuck. The Guinness Book of World Records, the Cleveland home of the home of the home of the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. All of this in Cleveland, Ohio. The All American City. How many events can we can we take over in nineteen? Okay, that seems a, a good place as any to, to stop this. Um, so yeah, one and a half million balloons released to great fanfare and excitement. Cleveland, back on the map. They did it. They did it, yep. everyone. Okay, so what happened immediately after that is that uh, the cold air and rain basically just forced all one million and a half balloons right back to the ground just causing massive amounts of traffic accidents and <clears throat> and uh and uh traffic jams uh it just total chaos what uh and uh it had it had some very uh unfortunate consequences in that right about the same time this was happening a little bit before that uh two fishermen had been reported missing and there was a coast guard search underway to look for them and actually their boat had been spotted and a helicopter was sent out but then a million and a half balloons landed on the on the water and were still kind of floating about right like low altitude <laughs> uh and they had to call off the search uh because they couldn't fucking see anything and and the two dudes died i mean they don't know if they were already dead but it was like they found them the next day and their bodies washed up on the shore and uh eventually one of the the wives sued the united way for like three million i think and they settled out of court uh that's two plus. bucks a balloon yeah 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 the united way did not come out on top in this one uh and then some miles away in another county in uh ohio uh, a woman's prized arabian horse got spooked by the balloons all of a sudden landing around it <laughs> and it like injured itself permanently horses yeah. yeah horses what are so do? dumb and she ended up she sued the united way also and they also settled out of court for that um this cat just we're gonna we're gonna add uh having gadget in my room while we're recording as another of history's greatest blunders <laughs> <laughs> uh this cat a uh, gadget. Yeah. Oh, and yeah. There was an airport. The uh, Burke Lakefront Airport had to shut down for a while because there's balloons all along the runway. And I, I guess you could probably land, or maybe they were in the air too. But that's that's probably not a good thing to try and fly a plane through a asteroid field of balloons. Probably not. No. Yeah. However, the Guinness Book of World Records does recognize the event as a world record, the largest ever mass balloon release. The with only... one million four hundred twenty nine thousand six hundred forty three balloons launched. They didn't they didn't quite hit one and a half million, but they were close. And no one's tried it ever since. No. <laughs> no. <laughs> I think that's um Lesson learned there, I think. Oh, Cleveland. Yeah. Let them keep their record. No one needs yeah. to beat it. 
they can have that. That's fine. Well, that was fun. Yeah. I made I made a reading list on Wikipedia for a bunch of these. And now um I don't know how to access the reading list. <laughs> Cause I'm I'm an idiot. So okay, what's this? Oh, uh Operation Wikinger, which is uh German for Viking during World War Two. Okay. Yeah. The like Nazis going. uh trying to keep an eye on uh on the, the North Sea between England and Europe. Um spotted some boats, fishing boats and whatnot, thought they might be spying, and uh they uh they send out a group of destroyers. So there might be submarines too. It's around the Dogger Bank, whatever the hell that is. It's the Yeah. Yeah, right up the the um east coast of England. Yeah. Yeah. Doggerland. <laughs> the Nazis uh sent out uh their first destroyer flotilla going to take out some submarines. Uh, and then also, at about the same time, the ex flieger Corps of the Luftwaffe planned to execute a, uh, a postponed anti-shipping operation over the North Sea using two squadrons of bombers. And they didn't talk to each other. There was no no coordination, no, no talking like, hey, we're going to go do this. Are you guys going to have people out there? Nope. So the, the Navy had requested a fighter escort and were denied. You, you can see where this is heading, right? Oh yeah. Yeah. So the, the flotilla uh, of destroyers were heading out, uh, navigating a minefield and a, a bomber flew over and uh, a lot of assuming, and they made asses out of themselves and they decided to to fire some machine guns at the bomber, which the bomber rightfully took as a hostile action, and started dropping bombs, which which hit hit the the Liberich Moss. I don't know what that means in German. Probably some dumb Nazi shit, but it sank. Um, and the bomber just went back on his merry way, like I did it. Mission I sank I sank a, a ship. A destroyer, <laughs> like <laughs> high fives all around, guys. So did did like they they didn't know what their own boats looked like. No, <laughs> I think this was early in the war. <laughs> like, what uh, what what symbols do we use for our own ships? Like, I don't know. Yeah, it's a boat. Fuck it. <laughs> did they wave? No, no, they just fired at us. Let's sink them. So then the rest of the ships. I think there were five, five or six destroyers. So. Uh, we're trying to help help the dudes from the Leberich Moss, uh, which didn't work because then then the the Max Schultz uh, hit a mine. It exploded, mm. and then the uh, thinking that they were under attack from submarines because that's what they were going to sink. They were going to go fight submarines. The Theodore Rydell started dropping depth charges, but then the explosions from their own depth charges jammed jammed their own rudder. So after about a half an hour of just total chaos, panic, um, the surviving four ships limped back home and uh yeah, in with their tail between their legs. Um Apparently there were no survivors from the Max Schultz and only 60 from the Leberich Moss. Well, 578 German soldiers died in all. Jeez. Good times. Yep. Fucking Germans. So not just Germans. I should, fucking Nazis. Germans are okay. Yeah. 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 <laughs> That uh, um that reminds me of, you ha- have you heard of the Millennium Challenge? Uh, vaguely. It was like a, yeah, in the early two thousands, the military 
spent like two hundred and fifty million dollars on these uh this war game they wanted to do to prove that they were like the most technologically advanced and this is how the future of warfare is gonna happen and um they uh Yeah, you gotta be prepared. Yeah, so they simulated um you know, a conflict between a, a Persian Gulf state like Iran or Iraq or something. And uh blue team was the US, red team was the uh the enemy. And uh what happened was like it was supposed to go on for two weeks. And what happened was on like the first day, um the lieutenant marine the marine guy uh that was in charge of the red team basically uh shot off all their cruise missiles they had all their all their technology turned off so they just like went dark shot off their cruise missiles and then just deployed like small motor boats for like suicide bombing and whatnot and um basically just completely destroyed the navy fleet and then the general that was in charge of the blue team was like, no, I want to do over. <laughs> yeah. Oof. <laughs> That's embarrassing. So yeah, he got it. He got his do over. And, um, basically when they restarted it, they had a uh, red team had to follow a script that ensured no, no turning off of radars and transponders. Yeah. They had to turn off all, all their, all their stuff. Or, or not not turn off, right? They had to keep it all on. They had to be easily identifiable. They had, well, no, yeah, they had to turn. They had to leave it on, so the navy could destroy it, and they weren't allowed to shoot down aircraft deploying troops. And um, yeah, the guy on the red team is like, "Fucking, this is bullshit." <laughs> yeah. So yeah. And so, yeah, it was basically just a big old $250 million boondoggle for some Sounds fucking, about right. yeah. some military brass to, to masturbate to, I guess. I don't know, but yeah, it's, they, it's funny. You know, it's weird. That actually reminds me of two different, uh, two different movies starring Kelsey Grammer. Isn't that weird? Uh, one's the, um, I think it's called Periscope Down, the submarine, the comedy. Yeah. Um, and then the, uh, what was that called? The the Pentagon tapes or something about the uh, creation of the the Bradley tank. I have not seen either of them. Well, uh, the, I think it's called the Pentagon. Thing. Uh, but it's got Kelsey Grammer in it. Also, and it's just about the total like, boondoggle, the creation of the Bradley tank, where it was like too many uh, cooks in the kitchen. And like one general wanted it to be like fast and another general wanted it to have firepower and another general wanted it to be an APC. And uh, like, so they tried to do all of those things. <laughs> and the, the guy who's like in charge of creating the Bradley was like, you know, uh, didn't rank as high as, as those guys. So he, he had to implement all of those things, which made it completely useless. Nice. In battle. It was an APC that, that had almost no armor, but, a but a cannon that like didn't work well, but it, I think it was like an HBO movie made just for HBO. Military intelligence. The I Pentagon mean, Wars. Right? That's what it's called. The Pentagon Wars. Those dummies. Yeah. You want um you want another wartime blunder or uh you wanna break it up? Uh actually I need to go to the bathroom. Let's take a little break here. How about that? Okay. That sounds good. All right, I'll be back in a couple minutes. Cool. And we're back. We're back. Special thanks to our uh, sponsor this week, um, Grandma Betty's Fish Pudding. Mmm. Mmm. Tasty. It's a uh, pudding made for fish. Wait, it's made for fish or of fish? No, it's not made. It's not 
pudding made out of fish. It's pudding made for fish. Oh. So, hence, uh, hence the pudding well, this is made for fish. <laughs> I've, because, you know, we, they gave us that whole pallet of fish pudding. I've been eating it. Oh, oh no. You're supposed to feed it to your fish. Okay, no, that makes sense. Because it did not taste good. No. I mean, I was saying that because they're sponsoring us. But, yeah, yeah now that I know it's for fish, I can probably say that, yeah. Yeah. That didn't get you sick, did it? No, no. not at all. Maybe you're a fish. Maybe there's there's some uh, DNA in there somewhere. The the old uh, antogeny recapitulates progeny. Yes, exactly. Where you start you start life off as a single celled organism. You. Uh, you have a tail at one point and gills. I know I did. Yeah, it's all part of the the gestation cycle. You got you you're all those things. And here we are now. Yep. Talking about dumb shit on a podcast. Two dumb guys talking about dumb shit. <laughs> pinnacle of humanity (laughs) (laughs) how's uh how's gadget doing she settled down she was running around out in the living room Uh, getting getting some of the zoomies out that's good all right i'm I'm gonna uh what, what would you rather hear next do you want space shit or um embarrassing australian shit uh, I kind of want to save Australian. Okay. Shit, that sounds like it would be the funnest. That's let's go. Let's good. go to space. Yeah. Okay. We're gonna talk about the Mars Climate Orbiter of 1998. So actually, there's uh, okay. So uh, the Mars Climate Orbiter was launched on December 11th, 1998 to study the Martian climate, which is why it was called the Mars Climate Orbiter and not whatever other planet. Because makes sense. Yeah, that checks out. Yeah, the uh, climate, atmosphere, surface changes, and to act as a communications relay in the Mars Surveyor 98 program for the Mars Polar Lander. Can you imagine how embarrassed they'd be if like, it showed up to Venus? (laughs) <laughs> Wait a second. <laughs> yeah. So uh, everything went according to plan until September 23rd, 1999, when communication with the spacecraft was lost as it went into orbital insertion. Oh. Yeah. So uh, they <laughs> couldn't figure out why. They're like, why did this thing just like just disappeared? Um, and then after going back and dotting all their T's and crossing all their I's, uh, they found out that the uh, software they used from Lockheed uh, was using a uh, pounds to force seconds instead of Newton seconds. And so the whole time there was, there was, different math was happening they weren't getting their newtons yeah and i i mean considering it it got to mars and almost got into orbit that's that's i mean some sort of accomplishment usually if you're if you're trying to use two different math equations like shit goes wrong real fast yeah yeah, it took too shallow of a, a, a trajectory, and they're not sure whether it just entered into the atmosphere 
it just burned up right away or if it sort of like skipped off the atmosphere and is just bounced off and roaming around yep flying out into heliocentric space some aliens gonna fight it look look what these dumb fucks did yep like well obviously they're using their weren't using their newton seconds they're using their yeah. seconds huh? aliens are gonna be using newtons <laughs> <laughs> I don't know exactly what that is yeah, I will say they um so it's basically like a, a a imperial uh measurements versus uh metric. That's that's what I took away from it cuz I'm not very smart. Well, I think I think it's two different types of thing. Yeah. Cuz like uh Newtons well, I mean yeah, Newtons they, do uh, like they it does measure force. But I think it's a gravity thing. I yeah, it was a uh, software that calculated the total impulse produced by thruster firings produced results in pound force seconds. The trajectory calculation software then used these results expected to be in Newton seconds incorrect by a factor of 4.45. Oh my God. That's... So many. That's or, a lot more than carrying. Not that many. I'm forgetting to carry the one. That's for sure. Yep. Uh, st- NASA still does not place the responsibility on Lockheed for the mission loss because they're like, we really should have checked that ourselves. Yeah. Well, how much did that cost? Uh, three hundred and twenty-seven point six million. Oh, nice. Hey, do you know that uh, Mike Pence fucked a horse, allegedly? <laughs> I've heard that. Fun fact. <laughs> allegedly. Alleged allegedly. fact. Allegedly, yeah. Gotta say allegedly, Joe. Yeah, a fun allegation. Okay. Uh, choice time again. Uh-oh. Do you want to uh, hear about Genghis Khan or Austrians? Not Australians. Austrians? Yeah. Yeah, this is a different different stories. Uh, let's go Genghis Khan. Okay. All right. So way back... Uh, Twelve eighteen. It's a it's a callback to our our plague episode. Yeah. Well, not really, because Genghis Khan was way earlier than that. Anyway, yeah. but it it ties in. Uh, so after consolidating a lot of territory, Genghis Khan, uh, on his the western border, um, it shared well, shared a border with uh the uh Khwarezmian empire of Khwarezmed in modern day Iran slash Iraq mm-hmm. and uh apparently he he was uh was he was he was good on conquests Genghis Khan wanted to get into the trade business. It's a good, so good he, place to he, do it. No, it. It wasn't Persian. It was... Khwarezmed. This was before the Persians or after the Persians? Uh, I think after. I, I mean, I, I guess it, you could still call it part of Persia or what would, what would have been Persia. So uh, Genghis Khan sent a uh, trade... Envoy to to Khwarezmed, and this guy the the Shah of Khwarezmed, Allah ad Din Muhammad, um, apparently was a real uh, how do I say this? Not paranoid, but like just suspicious. He had already uh, refused to make an obligatory homage to uh, to the Caliph 
um, of Islam so we're somewhere else. He was already kind of in some shit with uh, with some other empires. So the the Shah Al Adin Muhammad uh, apparently was real suspicious of uh, Genghis Khan's you know out outreaching for a trade agreement because he'd heard from China about how vicious the the Mongol savagery was. So instead of just taking it, the Mongols at face value and not offending him, so I, I guess this guy didn't give a shit about offending anyone. He like, like uh, gadget. denounced a. Uh, oh yeah, yeah. She just she just will pass by. Um, he declared that the trade envoys were were spies and confiscated all their shit and uh, killed killed the the trade envoys, beheaded them. Genghis Khan, um, totally let it go. He was like, you know what? That's fine. You guys do your thing. We'll do our thing. I ain't Sorry mad. to bother you. <laughs> no, that's not what happened at all. <laughs> uh, he sent an army of about 200,000 soldiers and just laid absolute waste. Yeah, that's not a guy you want to piss off, Genghis Khan. I guess there's a lot, there's some uh, debate about the size of the armies, but whatever. Uh, yeah, the Shah did not do well against the Mongols, and they sacked most of the cities of Khwarezmed, and then the, the guy, he didn't get killed, though. He had to flee, but yeah, he lost everything because he was a suspicious Greedy jerk. That's what happens, man. Buck around and find out. <laughs> yeah, he sure did. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I guess later he was just killed by highwaymen on the road. Like nothing left. Like Willie Nelson and Johnny Cash. Uh huh. Not they, the they... highwaymen, just highwaymen. <laughs> Not the super group. The highway. Who else was, was that? Waylon Jennings too. Waylon Jennings. Uh, fuck. Who else was in there? There was there was another one in there too. Not Chris Christopherson, right? He he wasn't part of that. I'm looking we it gotta up find right this now. Out. <laughs> Gadget's Co about to get off on the microphone super again. Group. You don't have too many country it was, super groups. Yeah, it was uh, Johnny Cash, Waylon Jennings. Chris Christopherson and Willie Nelson. Uh, yeah, okay. Good old Chris Christopherson. Yep. The famous actor. You ever see uh, uh, Billy the Kid? No. Chris Christopherson is Billy the Kid. Uh, No, I don't think I ever saw that. Bob Dylan's in it. Weird. Is it any good? I liked it. Okay. It's, pretty, it's called Pat Garrett and Billy the Kid. Oh, okay. That sounds more familiar. Sam Sam Peckinpah movie. Yeah. I like Sam Peckinpah. Yeah. What What's your favorite Western movie? Uh, shit. <laughs> we can it's got to be a It's got to be a Sam Peckinpah movie. Either either that. Pat Garrett and Billy the Kid or uh, The Wild Bunch. I love The Wild Bunch. Yeah. That movie's awesome. Um, yeah, you know, I mean, like, all the spaghetti westerns, they're fun. All the, the Clint Eastwoods. Mm-hmm. Until he started directing them, but... <laughs> I like uh, Ombre, Paul Newman. I think that's my favorite Western. I didn't see that one. Oh, it's great. It was uh, an Elmore Leonard book. Who I like. Mm -hmm. Maybe it's a short story. I don't remember. That's, that's how big of a fan I am. Okay. Uh, now our choices are between Civil War and uh, Austrians. Wait, which civil war? Like our civil war? Yes, the American Civil War. I guess there have been a few. 
<laughs> it's been a few over the years. <laughs> Very civil those wars. Uh, wait, what was the other the other choice? Uh, how about this um, crater or schnapps? Crater or schnapps? Yeah, let's go schnapps. Schnapps, it is. Okay, we're talking about the. Oh man, I don't know how to say this. Battle of Karansebes, Karansebes, whatever. Um, it's like talking about 1788. The Austrian army were scouting for forces of the Ottoman Empire. Okay. Oh, is it? They were against the Ottomans. They were trying to find find out where those Turks were. Um, those dang Turks. So this army of Austria, uh, approximately 100,000 strong. Um, they were setting up camp around Karansebis. Uh The army's vanguard, a contingent of hussars, uh, crossed the Tumish River to scout. Um, there, were, there were no Ottoman forces around, uh, but the hussars... Uh, came across a group of uh, Romanis who offered to sh- sell a, a, a couple barrels of schnapps to the weary soldiers. And they said, hell yes, that sounds really good. Could really go for some schnapps right now. I think I know where this is going. So they they got shit-faced and uh, decided to camp out. Then some infantry from the Austrian Austrian army came up and they're like, whoa, you guys got schnapps? Like, can we have some too? And the hussars said, fuck no, <laughs> get lost. These are our barrels of schnapps to which the infantry said, I don't think so. We're going to have some whether you like it or not. So the hussars uh, set up fortifications around the barrels of snuffs and <laughs> dug in. The infantry, <laughs> uh, in the heated argument, started firing upon the hussars, and they then engaged in combat. So everyone else nearby thought that the Turks were attacking and started yelling, Turks, Turks, oh shit. Um, but then the, the Hussars heard that and they're like, oh, right now, really? There's Turks attacking? Let's get out of here. The infantry also ran away. So there was a bunch of different, there was Austrians, Serbs, uh, Croatians, Italians, uh, and a lot of them didn't understand each other. So again... Uh, chaos ensued and the whole army thought they were under attack and started firing upon another. Uh, so apparently uh, all the, the commands for halt were uh, mistaken as Allah and um, they did not heed the, the command for halt. Um, oh man. As the Hussars fled through the camps, a corps commander, uh, General of Artillery Colorado, thought it was a cavalry charge by the Ottoman army and ordered artillery fire. Meanwhile, the entire camp awoke to the sound of battle. In the camp. Yep. And uh, the troops fired at every shadow, thinking the Ottomans were everywhere. Comfy chairs all over the place. More like couches, right? Or, or like footstools. Yeah, but like cushioned footstools. You can sit yeah. on them too. I guess so. In reality, they were shooting fellow Austrian soldiers. And the whole time they're hearing Allah, Allah. <laughs> Thank you. It's, it's the Turk <laughs> battle cries. <laughs> uh-huh. But really, it's hey, sometimes the... we we hear what we want to hear. <laughs> The incident escalated to the point where the whole army retreated 
from the imaginary enemy. And Holy Roman Emperor Joseph II was pushed off his horse into a small creek. I think that's the real tragedy right there. Some dude just like <laughs> bumped him off his horse to take his horse, <laughs> threw him yeah. in the creek. We, we got to get out of here. <laughs> Move. Your holiness, get out of my way. Uh, two days later, the Ottoman army did arrive. They just discovered the wounded and dead everywhere and easily took the city. Um, They're just like, oh, what the fuck are these guys doing? <laughs> uh, thanks. All over, all over a couple barrels of gypsy snops. Yeah, they figure about 10,000 guys died. Oh, the, shit. From the fire. You can't say gypsy anymore, can you? Romani, that's... Yeah. Sorry, my bad. It's okay. You get you get one mulligan per episode. I would classify that as a as a, a great blunder. It's very blundering, yes. All right. So there's only two left. So I'm gonna save the best one for the last. Okay. Um this one. July thirtieth, eighteen sixty four. The uh Major General Ambrose Burnsides, who you might know of from uh, the term sideburns. So we get that. He had some majestic sideburns. Although you, I don't know why. The, are you kidding me? That's where sideburns came from? Yeah, from the general Burnside. <laughs> and this is a uh, Civil War era, I'm assuming. Yeah. Yeah. Because, yeah, that's the only time dudes were named Ambrose. Yeah. It was during, yeah, during the mid to late 19th century. Yeah, you don't see too many Ambroses anymore. So uh, the Union Army was um, laying siege to uh, the Confederate defenses at Petersburg, Virginia. I guess it was going to, somebody had... The idea. Oh, they had the the Confederates had tunnels, I think, and um, so the uh, the Union got Mister Ambrose Burnside had the idea to put a bunch of um, explosives underground. Let's see if I can find out how much. Um, I just want to find out how much explosives were used. So yeah, there was a bunch of mines under the battlefield and they didn't like that so they're going to blow it up and then and then just uh attack on on top of the ground as i guess you normally would whatever who gives a shit uh they used a lot of explosives like way too much like uh have you ever heard that story about the beached whale in oregon oh yeah in the, i was in the just 80s? thinking yeah. that yeah <laughs> this is a a similar situation in that uh, they definitely went overkill. On they the they were using force pounds equations instead of Newtons. Yeah, yes, they were. <laughs> uh, so when they set it off, it was uh, an epic explosion, massive explosion, and so. Still with the uh, the air full of smoke and, and soot and the dirt still raining down around them, uh, Burnside decides to send his men into the breach. Like, uh, what was that from? Richard Richard III? Once more into the breach? Uh, sounds about right. Yeah. Shake a spear? Mm-hmm. Uh, so they did, they, they went into it. Um, but what they went into was just a huge crater, <laughs> a big bowl, which the Confederates from their defenses had a, a really nice view and aim down into. Oh yeah. You ever heard the sh shooting fish in a barrel? Mm -hmm. It was a lot like that. Yeah, uh, yeah. Is it, give him pudding. 
Yep, like shooting grandma, uh, grandma Betty's fish pudding. Give him some of that in a barrel. You can shoot him mm. all day long. Oh, yeah, that's right. You're not supposed to eat it. <laughs> not, mm, not for human consumption, as it turns out. Yeah. So, um, yeah, a lot of dudes died for like no reason. I guess that's a lot of these stories are like that. A little bit of a uh, little bit of foresight. Big, big waste. This long. Big wastes, waste of money, waste of lives. And I, I think uh, Burnside's got got. Uh, I don't know about demoted, but he definitely. Um, it was not a a, a victory. Got his tails in my face. Uh, hey, check out dude. my butthole! It's awesome. <laughs> Why do cats always want you to look at their butthole? Get it. Get out of here. What are you doing? Catch it. Stepping on the keyboard, bumping into the mic arm. Yeah, apparently there is an actual quote in that um the the Confederates shooting down into the crater upon the Union soldiers was a turkey shoot. Old one of them old good old turkey shoots. Yep. Man, Union casualties were 504 killed, almost 2,000 wounded, 1,400 missing or captured. The Confederates had a lot killed, too. 361 killed. An ugly mess all around. So that leaves us with the Great Emu War. Emu. Mm Mm-hmm. Emu or emu? I I think either one is acceptable. The Emu War, also known as the Great Emu War, was a nuisance wildlife management military operation undertaken in Australia over the latter part of 1932. Okay, so uh, in the 30s, early 30s, uh, Australia... Decided to give a bunch of land to uh, World War One veterans, and was like, "Hey guys, I know Western Australia looks like a lot of desert right now, but you guys get in there, irrigate it, manage this land, and we're gonna have we're gonna have some nice farms out there. I'm gonna create all this farmland. Get in there, mate. Yeah, make this farmland." Can you hear Gadget meowing? <laughs> no. Okay, good. She's doing the silent meow, cause, but she's doing it right next to the microphone. Ah, jeez, cat. Gadget. So, uh, so I guess, I guess they, the farming started in the twenties, um, and then the Great Depression of nineteen twenty nine hit, um. And the farmers were encouraged to uh, increase their wheat crops uh, with the government promising and failing to deliver assistance in the form of subsidies. Um, In spite of the recommendations and the promised subsidies, wheat prices continued to fall. And by October 1932, matters were becoming intense, with the farmers preparing to harvest the season's crop while simultaneously threatening to refuse to deliver the wheat. She was she was stressful, um, and then their difficulties uh, increased by the arrival of as many as twenty thousand emus, uh, who regularly migrated through that that area after their breeding season. Uh, but with the cleared land and additional water supplies being made available for livestock. Um, the emus found that the cultivated lands were an excellent habitat and they began to foray into farm territory. Why not? Yep. Okay. His tail got me right in the eye. (laughs) I would, I'd 
kick her out of my room, but then her the sound of her trying to get in would be just as loud <laughs> as her banging her head into the microphone. Only top quality podcasting over here. Podcasting. <laughs> Nailed it. Okay, so the emus uh, consumed crops, spoiled crops, trampled, um, as well as leaving large gaps in fences where rabbits could enter. And that's a whole other thing with Australian rabbits. Jeez, they always species. have like weird problems over there. They got like the emu problem, the rabbit problem, the fucking cane toad problem. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's a very, like, it was a very isolated, evolutionarily isolated. So, like, everything is an invasive species to Australia. Yeah. Well, like, yeah, dingoes, they were introduced, weren't they? As a, as so a many, domestic dog, so... and then they uh, went feral and just became a wild species. That sounds very plausible. Okay, so then uh, the farmers relayed their concerns about the emus ravaging their crops, and a, a deputation of ex-soldiers were sent to meet with the Minister of Defense, Sir George Pierce. So having served in World War I, the soldiers' settlers were well aware of the effectiveness of machine guns, and they requested their deployment. Gun them down. Uh, like, the were, they, were they like the like hand crank? Gatling guns. I think they were a little uh, more sophisticated than that, but probably close. Um, so it was agreed upon. They're like, yeah, do it. But we're going to like, they're going to send some soldiers and only the military personnel was allowed to use like the machine guns. That's I mean, reasonable. It's kind of responsible. Yeah. Um, okay. So the, the war was conducted under the command of Major GPW Meredith of the Seventh Heavy Battery of Royal Australian Artillery. He only had a couple soldiers with him. They had Lewis guns and ten thousand rounds of ammunition. I want to look but up this right gun. before they could start. Uh, there was a period of heavy rainfall that caused the emus to scatter much wider. Okay, yeah. This makes sense. The the Lewis gun? Is that what you're looking up? Yeah, that's the like the it looks like the um the ones that the Germans used. Yeah. This one was uh American, I think. It's got that uh circular drum on the top. Yeah. The little uh slide carousel. Anyway. Yep. On on November the second, the men traveled to Campion. I don't know where that is. Uh where some fifty emus were sighted. Fifty? Uh, Holy shit. Yeah. As the birds were out of range of the guns, the local settlers attempted to <clears throat> herd the emus into an ambush. But the birds split into small groups and ran so they were difficult to target. Nevertheless, while the first fusillade from the machine guns was ineffective due to range, a second round of gunfire was able to kill a number of birds. Later the same day, a small flock was encountered, and perhaps a dozen birds were killed. <laughs> what was that? <laughs> I just, sorry, I just clicked on something by accident. <laughs> uh, so a couple of days later... Um, they they had they set up another ambush near a dam where they, they saw more than a thousand emus. This time the gunners waited until the birds were in close proximity. And they opened fire, but the guns jammed. They killed about ten, ten, twelve. The Man. remainder scattered before any more could be shot. First Gallipoli, and then they lose a war against birds. 
By the fourth day of the campaign, army observers noted that each pack seemed to have its own leader now, a big black-plumed bird which stands fully six feet high and keeps watch while his mates carry out their work of destruction and warns them of our approach. This is when uh, Meredith the leader, uh, tried to mount one of the guns on a truck, a move that proved to be ineffective as the truck was unable to gain on the birds <laughs> and the ride was so rough that the gunner was a- unable to fire any shots by the 8th of November, six days after the first engagement, 2,500 rounds of ammunition had been fired. The number of birds killed was uncertain. One account estimates that it was 50 birds, but other accounts ranged from 200 to 500. Say so yeah, a ladder figure being provided by settlers. Hundred and fifty thousand rounds. I think that they, they had ten thousand rounds. Ten thousand rounds. Yeah, For they fifty they birds. Fully, they went through a quarter of them already. Meredith's official report noted that his men had suffered no casualties. So they had that going for them. <laughs> That's good. Not even, not even someone just shooting them themselves in the foot. Not yet. Uh, summarizing the coals, ornithologist Dominic Servanty commented, the machine gunner's dreams of point-blank fire into the serried masses of emus were soon dissipated. The emu command had evidently ordered guerrilla tactics, and its unwieldy army soon split up into innumerable small units that made use of the military equipment uneconomic. A crestfallen field force, therefore, withdrew from the combat area after about a month. On the 8th of November, members in the Australian House of Representatives discussed the operation following the negative coverage of the events in the local media that included claims that only a few emus had died. Pierce withdrew the military personnel and the guns also on November 8th. After the withdrawal, Major Meredith compared the emus to Zulus and commented on the striking maneuverability of the emus even while badly wounded. If we had a military division with the bullet-carrying capacity of these birds, it would face any army in the world. They can face machine guns with the invulnerability of tanks. They are like Zulus whom even dum-dum bullets could not stop. Man. Fucking chalk one up for the birds. Yeah. So I guess they they tried again about four days later. (laughs) Uh, with Meredith also in command again. You think that was just like a a joke assignment? Yeah. Oh, send this guy in. Had to have been. (laughs) (laughs) Fucking put Meredith on it. Go after the emus. Then he lost. (laughs) Taking to the field on the thirteenth of November. The military found a degree of success over the first two days with approximately 40 emus killed. The third day, the 15th of November, proved to be far less successful. But by December the 2nd, they killed approximately 100 emus per week. I guess that's pretty good. But we're talking also about, what do they say, about 20,000 emus in the area. Meredith was recalled on December 10th. And in his report, he claimed 986 kills with 9,860 rounds. That's an awfully like rounded off comparable like, number at a rate of exactly 10 rounds per confirmed kill. Fuck. That sounds totally made up. That Well, shit, man. It takes 10 bullets to kill one emu. <laughs> yeah. Meredith claimed... 2,500 wounded birds had died as a result of the injuries they had sustained. Yeah. Wait, how many injuries? 2,500. Well, it died from injuries. They're figuring. They shot them um, and they ran off. Probably died somewhere. I meant like soldiers' injuries. Oh, no, none. Okay. No soldiers were hurt. Just embarrassed. <laughs> Despite the problems encountered with the coal, the farmers of the region once again requested military assistance in 1934, 1943, and 1948. 
only to be turned down by the government. Nah, mate. Yeah, very um, embarrassing. That's fun. Yeah. I like that one. No, no humans don't, died in it. Yeah, don't go to war with emus. Yeah. I think that's the lesson that we've learned from all of these stories. Yeah, just don't. Balloon Fest 86, don't mess with emus. Brings it all back around, doesn't it? NASA it, Mars Climate Observer, don't mess with emus. Puts it all in perspective. It really does. That's why we're an informational podcast. Yeah. You fucking dumb guys arguing about dolphins. <laughs> Don't mess with emus. Emus? Fuck around and find out. That's right. They'll Genghis Khan your ass. <laughs>